Hello everyone, you're very welcome to the Aviva Stadium and to the beginning of Pensions Awareness Week. My name is Dan Malone and today we're going to be discussing everything you need to know about starting a pension in Ireland. Joining me on the panel today to discuss this topic are Claire Louise Murphy from Aviva and Aaron O'Toole from moneycube.e. You're both very welcome. Thanks, Dan. Claire, I want to kick things off with yourself for the first question, and it's a very fitting question for the beginning of Pensions Awareness Week. In the most simplest of terms, what is a pension? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, a pension is a long-term saving plan for yourself, for the income that you want to live off in retirement. So that's what you're saving for, the income that you want to live off in your retirement. I think that's a very clear and concise definition because I know when people Google what is a pension, they're met with lots of terminology Absolutely. and complex jargon that they might not understand. So it's great to just get that definition right off the rip. Aaron, I might go to yourself here. Why should anyone start a pension in the first place? Yeah, look, I think the first thing is obviously a lot of people are scared, even with the word. They're, they're just, it, it overwhelms them as such. So I think it's getting, even just starting is the, the most important thing. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, if you just look at the state pension, for example, it's, it's 253 euro and 30 cents a week. Uh, it's just, just, just over a thousand euro a month. So it's, it's designed really just to cover the, bare, the basics. So whether that's food, groceries, uh, any bills as such. So anything after that, when you retire, it's up to you to save for really. I think there's a common like conception in society that pensions are just something for older people. Is there such a thing as being too young for a pension or is it for anyone or of any age or is there any sort of predefined limit to when you can get started? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I suppose it's, it's, it's geared towards older people in the sense that obviously, please God, we're all going to live longer and we're all going to have to draw down a pension at some stage. So, I mean, we're all going to get, get to that age where we're going to have to draw down a pension. So it's in, in regards to starting early, it's, it's obviously best to, to start early. Keep, <coughs> excuse me. You've longer to save. Um, and, and again, build up that pension pot so you can enjoy your retirement when you get to that relevant age. Okay, okay. And you mentioned the state pension there. So would you mind just clarifying for the audience, what is the difference between the state pension and the kind of private pensions that we're actually talking about here today? Yeah, so state pension is based around the, the amount of PRSI contributions that you make. So everyone, everyone can be entitled to it, dependent on the, their level of, of PRSI contributions throughout their working life. So private pensions or personal pension, whatever it might be, is up to yourself to save for. So it, it's really up to you to, to kick that into gear going forward. Okay, that's great. And that's great. And you're saying that for the majority of people, the state pension, it might not be enough to sustain themselves. And that's why pensions exactly. are important. Exactly. Yeah. As I said, it, it, it's really geared just towards the cover basics, the basic necessities in life. So, um, I mean, we're all going to work, hopefully, for a long and lustrous career. So it, it's being able to enjoy retirement. That, that's up to us to save for, really. Okay, I think Aaron put that nicely there, being able to enjoy your retirement. So he's kind of sold us on the why you should start a pension. Claire, I might go back to yourself here. How would someone go about putting money into their pension? And we might touch on both the, from the perspective of someone who's employed and the perspective of someone who's self-employed, perhaps. Yeah, of course. So if you're in employment, uh, your employer might run what's called a group pension. So you can join that. It's usually after kind of six months probationary period that you can go into the scheme. Uh, your employer may contribute to it. There's different levels. You will contribute to it as well. Sometimes they're matching or, as I said, your employer might uh, contribute more and you match then at a certain level as well. Now, before you go into the pension scheme, or if your employer doesn't actually have a pension scheme that's running, you can join what's called a, a PRSA. So that's a policy that's uh, personal to yourself. Um, so a, a different uh, fund range, but the, the retirement benefits are the same. There's tax relief on the contributions. So that's if you're in employment, you have those two options. And if you're self-employed, uh, most recently a lot of self-employed were going into what's called an executive uh, per, uh, pension product. Unfortunately, that has been taken off the market for the moment uh, due to new legislation. But you can still, the PRSA is available to the self-employed. There's tax relief, so you can claim that um, as a self-employed person. You can still contribute uh, up to the maximum levels. Uh, which are the same. There's a very good fund choice, probably not as much as there would have been in the executive uh, pensions, but you can still retire in the same way. And um, so there's the four different options, a pension for life, you can go down a, what's called an ARF, which is continuing on in a, a pension product. You can maybe take a taxable lump sum, or you can take your tax-free cash from your PRSA and continue in actually uh, in that investment as well. So there's lots of options for both the employed and self-employed out there. 
And for someone who's in employment, perhaps watching this, and they're not sure what their position is with regards to their pension, and they perhaps want to get started and start making contributions, is it just a case of having a conversation with their employer? Do they have to contact payroll, HR? What's the general way that people can get started putting money into their pension? Yeah, so usually it would be that uh, as part of their contract when they're starting, you know, the pension would be mentioned in there. But if not, absolutely, you know, starting point is contacting your HR department. They will be able to tell you all about it. Your uh, pension contributions are deducted as part of your salary. So if that's not already happening, again, you can contact the HR department and they will set it up and they will speak to the, the payroll in the company. It's not that you have to do all that work yourself. So I'd say starting point, if you're unsure, Either have a look at your contract um, or, you know, contact your HR. But if you are in a company for a few years and you're actually in a pension scheme, you should be getting an annual benefit statement once a year. So if you have that, you're in a pension scheme. Okay. And yeah. then from the perspective of the self-employed individual, I would assume that they have to put the money in themselves and then perhaps file a tax return or something at the end of the year to, to kind of figure things out. Yeah, so I mean, they should get in touch with everybody, should get in touch with a financial advisor, especially you know, the self employed, or if you're going to pension yourself. So that would be the starting point for the self employed to contact a financial advisor so they can talk them through the different PSAs, the different offerings from the different companies as well, because the fund range might uh, vary from company to company. And mm -hmm. um, so they will put in touch with them and sort it out how that they, they pay their contributions. And yes, their end of year tax return as a self employed person is where they will look after the tax for that but they'll get their tax relief as well. Claire I might just stick with you for this next question sure. as well so we've done a bit of talking around just pensions generally and why you should start it and how you go about putting money in it but again to a lot of people watching it's still quite ambiguous what's actually going on with the pension so I know especially during 2020 and 2021 a lot of people would have been familiar with you know investing in things like GameStop stock and a lot of hype uh, investments that people were making in cryptocurrencies what is the difference between investing in a pension and investing in the likes of stocks and cryptocurrencies? Sure, well, what I would just say, first of all, about the, the crypto and the stocks is uh, more so crypto. Lot, not a lot of pensions would be driven like that. Uh, you know, the pension products are approved by the central bank and they're more focused on investing in funds um, that over the long term will, uh, you know, perform differently, but to get a return that will purchase your income for retirement. The cryptocurrencies, um, you know, as you said, like they are very much a recent thing. They are about the stocks and the different companies or the, the virtual money. Um, we're still not 100% sure of them. They're not around long enough for us to be able to kind of judge. You know, usually like uh, funds have a performance over many, many years that we can judge. They've already had very highs and very lows uh, recently. We'll just have to watch and see how they go. But in general, I would say that pension products wouldn't necessarily be driven uh, towards crypto because they'd mm. probably be seen as a higher risk, okay. um, you know, than maybe the other pension funds, which have, there's different risk levels in the different funds, but that's geared towards where you are in your, in your retirement journey. The closer you're getting, the less risk you want. So, you know, okay. it is possible that you could invest in a pension product if it allows you to invest in stocks and cryptocurrencies. I don't think there's that many of them around. Okay, okay. Yeah. So for the most part, the world of pensions and pension investing is at the moment very much separate to the world of cryptocurrencies. Absolutely, and yeah. Stock. Okay, okay, yeah. that makes sense. Aaron, again, I might just go to you for this next one as well, and this is going to be a very important question on the minds of a lot of the viewers. How do you go about figuring out how much you should actually put into your pension? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that's probably what stops a lot of people um, digging in and, and going mm. for it straight away. So, I mean, the first thing is what you can afford. I mean, there's no point in saving for um, this great retirement if you're, if you're struggling on a day-to-day -day basis. If, if, um, yeah, if, if you just if you can't get by in 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 um in today, but like th that's the main thing. It's I suppose it's the conversations we have to have with your financial advisor, and um, they can obviously take a look at your overall picture, see what you can afford. Um, but that that's that'll be the main thing. What you can afford uh, to put away. Obviously, starting starting younger. Uh, the earlier you start, the longer you have to be invested, so you can you can get away with putting yeah. not as much in. Where, for example, like it's a 30 year old uh, as opposed to a 50 year old starting off a pension, uh, a 50 year old have to put in three times as much to, to get to the same retirement pot when they're drawn down the money. And um, the other thing to note obviously is that there, as uh, Claire touched on as well, the different levels of tax relief that you, that you can um, get relief on based on your, uh, your salary and stuff like that. So they're the two main points uh, in regards to how, how much you can put in. But 
again, I'd always come back to not leaving yourself short. Um, because again, there's no point in saving for this great retirement if, if you're struggling on okay. a day-to-day -day basis. There's two things I want to kind of expand on there, if that's all right. So first of all, you mentioned this concept of affordability and being able to you know, sure. afford what you can actually put into your pension. Yeah. Is that something you've been seeing at MoneyCube, like especially with the inflation and the cost of living crisis? Are people struggling to actually put money into their pension? Is this becoming a thing that's actually a problem? I mean, the, the, uh, for, for me personally, it's always a case of once you start it, I think what puts a lot of people off is making that first contribution. Okay. Once you see that first contribution go out, that's it. You can budget for it going forward. It's, it's a matter of building it into your overall financial plan, really. Uh, so again, not leaving yourself short. So um, like, I'll, I'll always come back to that, not, not leaving yourself short. Um, but yeah, like it, there's always a case as well. You can you can mix and match around with your contributions as well. So if it is a case that you're you're going through a rough period or for whatever reason costs are high, um, there's always that ability to, to pair back your, your your contributions as well for a period of time. Okay, that's great to know because I think people will be worried that they're signing themselves up to something that they can't get out of. But there yeah. is flexibility with how exactly. much they can actually contribute. Exactly. Yeah. The second thing I want to touch on then is just you mentioned about tax benefits, right? So we yeah. always hear this idea of pensions are great for reducing tax. Could you explain, again, in simple terms, what is the actual tax benefits of investing in a pension? Yeah, I mean, the government really wants you to save for your retirement. Uh, and the way they do that is really a three-pronged approach. So again, you're getting tax relief on the contributions you put in. So say, for example, a higher rate taxpayer, for every 100 euro that's going into your pension, you're actually only putting in 60 euro. The government's putting in 40 euro. You're getting tax relief on, on, for that 40 euro. Uh, the other point is tax-free growth. So again, your, your money's invested. It is time to compound and grow over a long period of time. Uh, there's no tax on, on that growth. And then again, when you get to retirement, within certain limits, you can take, uh, you can draw down a tax-free tax lump sum uh, as well. So again, it's, it's a three-pronged approach, um, but yeah, the, the benefits are huge. As I said, the government really wants you to save for your retirement. And we just talked about there with Claire about investing in stocks and cryptocurrencies. So what you're saying is that by investing in a pension, this is effectively tax relief that you know average investors couldn't get if they were to put money into the likes of stocks 100%. and crypto. This is a separate thing. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So good. even starting off, regardless of the the um, how the stocks or the shares that you're invested in perform or the funds that you're invested in perform, you're already up uh, based on the tax relief that the government is helping you contribute to your pension. So okay. Um, yeah. Big point to know. And is there any limit to how much someone can put in, or is it? So unlimited? again, there's age-related limits based on, on your age. So, for example, uh, uh, between, between the ages of 30 and 39, you can put in 20% up to 20% of your salary and claim tax relief on it. Um, now, obviously, there is limits. It's up to a, a salary of 115 grand, but a lot of people would fall below that, so they could be well within their limits. Okay, very good. And Claire, I might just go back to you again because yeah. I know earlier you mentioned this concept of employer matching. We kind of didn't really expand on it. Yeah. Could you just explain a bit more about what employer matching is? Because I know this can be very, very valuable for people investing in pensions. Absolutely, of course. And I suppose what to remember is like if you are in employment and you're in an occupational pension scheme, your employer is saving for your future as well, so that income. So what I mean by matching contributions is, if, for example, if you were to pay 5% of your salary in your uh, contribution to your pension, your employer might match that 5%. Or there's different tiers, like for example, you could pay in 4%, they might pay in 8%. So that's what I mean about matching contributions or them paying a contribution and you paying a contribution. So not only are you saving, you're getting your tax relief, the employer is saving for you as well, and that's all going towards your income. And in addition to that, then you're going to have the state pension as well. So it's effectively yeah. free money that people are getting by choosing to invest yeah. in the pension. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think even what Aaron was saying, there's probably a bit of a, a misconception that pensions aren't affordable mm. or it's definitely, you know, it's it's something that you should be saying or not saving for, but something that people only think that they should think about in the future. But, you know, that might be too late to, to start thinking about. You need to start thinking about it now. And, you know, as you were saying, they're more affordable. The tax relief there, I think people are just have this misconception that if they're trying to save for mortgage or paying rent or you have all of those other daily bills that you can't actually afford your pension. Yeah. But it's probably more affordable than you think. And as I said, the government are giving uh, giving you something for nothing, which they rarely do yeah. with the tax relief. So that's it's, brilliant. Yeah. And just the last point on that as well, and I know Pensions Awareness Week has a session about the employee value proposition, so we won't stick on this yep. too, for too much, but I know, this, you know the whole great resignation, people you know, leaving jobs for yep. things, other things they want to do, but do you think, generally speaking, younger people and people of any age should be looking really closely at what kind of pension benefits that their employer are offering? Is that becoming more of a thing? 
nowadays. Of course, you know, and again, I suppose it, it depends what of what age you're kind of going into employment, you know, and maybe for people that are in their 20s and 30s, their focus isn't on their pension because, mm. again, it's probably their salary or if they're saving for houses or whatever, whatever it is that they're saving for and not necessarily their pension. But I can't underestimate how important that is as an employment package okay. because, again, your employer is saving for you for your future. So why not? It's definitely something that I would look at if I was going to another job. It's super important. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. So, Claire, let's say someone has decided to put money into their pension. There's money going in on a recurring basis. When, when that money actually leaves their, their paycheck and goes to the pension account, can they control where that money gets invested or what kind of funds it goes into or is all, that, all of that done on their behalf? It can be both. So, yeah. you know, um, they, they can choose themselves, you know, the funds that they want to go into, obviously speaking to their employer or their financial advisor, depending on different kind of pension that you want to go into. An individual pension or PRSA, you would have more control over the funds because it's individual to you, you're picking the funds. In the employment uh, or the occupation and pension scheme, your employer might choose a, a investment strategy for the entire scheme okay. uh, with the trustees. But again, that's a choice. Your employee, uh, yourselves, you can fill out your own application form, which might have a different fund choice. In addition to that, though, what is called a default investment a lifestyling strategy, a mm -hmm. um, bit of a mouthful there. But what that means in basic terms is, uh, if you don't want to choose your own pension funds, which again, a lot of people don't because they might not know that enough about them, uh, they will go into the default investment strategy and over time, over what's called a glide path, you will uh, start out in the riskier funds the further away you are from uh, retirement and as you move towards your retirement age, you will, uh, on a monthly basis, come out slowly towards the less riskier funds so that you have a secure pension pot when you retire. So it, it's, there, there's definitely choice. It probably depends on whether it's an individual pension or an occupational, but there's definitely choice and flexibility for control. I suppose it's very much that idea of the curse of choice as well, right? Because if you're someone who doesn't know anything about yeah. the pensions landscape and you're suddenly asked to pick a personal retirement savings account or PRSA exactly, product, yeah. you might not know where to start. So. What kind of factors should be considered when looking for a PRSA? I know people talk a lot about fees and charges. That's been in the news quite, quite a bit. Maybe talk us through like, you know, our pension PRSA products, are they quite expensive? What to look out for, things like that. Yeah, so the PRSA uh, product in particular, again, that will have a default investment strategy option if you don't want to choose your funds or then you can self-select your own funds. The fund choice for a PRSA mightn't have as an extensive uh, fund range as other pension products. There is capping on charges with the PRSA, so it's 1% on the, the uh, fund value or 5% of your contributions per annum. Uh, as I said, the retirement benefits and how you can take them is exactly the same as well. But the fund choice, yeah, so again, it's, you should look at how long you have to retirement and probably your attitude to risk. You know, like, uh, again, people that don't know that much about funds would probably automatically go to low risk, medium risk. They just, you know, there's a, a fear about it. But the longer you are out from your retirement date, uh, the more time you have to invest in riskier funds because there's going to be highs and lows as there is with every single fund you know it kind of happens in six year cycles so if you're 20 or 25 years out from retirement you have that time to you know go through the highs and lows if you're closer to retirement yes you probably want the less riskier funds and that's okay because you're securing that pot to purchase your income so yeah i would say attitude to risk definitely and how long you have left to retirement are probably the two main factors to be looking at yeah and there is yeah. a lot to consider and i suppose yep. that's why it's good to to have the likes of a financial advisor by your side absolutely, that you can talk yeah. to about all this stuff. Yeah, so. absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, Aaron, we kinda, we've kind of we talked a lot about starting a pension, what it is, why you should do it, how you can get started, things like that. What in your mind, and Claire, I might ask this question to you as well, what in your mind is the first step someone can take after the, they've watched this session to actually get started? What do you think is the first thing they should do? Yeah, so for me, the first thing is taking ownership of it, really. Okay. Uh, if, if, you, if you're after watching this, you're obviously interested in pensions or obviously have a feeling that you kind of want to get set up yourself. So first thing I would say is to make a promise to yourself, whether that's get in touch with a financial advisor, um, have a look into it yourself, certainly get the ball rolling uh, again, because there's, there's no better time than now to, to kick off a pension scheme going forward or a pe pe uh, personal pension plan. Um, for people like employees, as Claire kind of touched on, uh, I'll, there's the possibility or the opportunity to maybe dig into your HR department, ask for a bit of information, see what's, what's on offer. Um, again, if there's any matching, 
um, that they can avail of. Uh, and then for personal pensions, stuff like that, again, um, always uh, best to discuss with your financial advisor. So mm -hmm. obviously it's coming up to um, what we in the business call pension, um, pension season. Uh, again, a lot of people try to capitalize on uh, tax relief and stuff for, for the year-end tax. So uh, yeah, a lot of people try to kick it off this time of year. So uh, again, always discuss with your financial advisor. Okay, and Claire, same question to yourself. Yeah, and the exact same with what Aaron has said. But what I would also say is that you know, over the years, all of the different companies that are, are pension providers have tried to remove the jargon uh, from the information on their, their websites. They're a lot more clear, a lot easier to understand. So while you're, you know, having a look in to see whether you're part of an occupational pension, dig out your annual benefit statement and um, yeah, have a look online. You know, all of the, the pension product providers are really clear. You know, they all have the guides to the different pension products. Do your own bit of revision. You know, yeah, th there's lots online that is a lot less complex than it has been over the years so Definitely. have a look around yeah Aaron Claire thank you very much for joining us here today it's been a very informative session on starting a pension in Ireland cheers Dan. thanks thank you Dan. thank you all very much for watching and make sure to check out the other sessions that will be happening throughout the week on the pensions awareness week website thanks